as was mentioned, I started the field of virtual reality. That was a long time ago. Am I too far? Can you hear me? Am I speaking too fast? It's all good? Okay. So, <laughs> um, in this world of futurism, I'm kind of an elder now. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, back in the early 1980s, I was trying to explain the ideas of virtual reality to audiences. And at the time, it was so fantastic that people just couldn't get it the first three times. And I'd have to explain it over and over again. And suddenly they'd go, oh my god. <laughs> and they got very excited. And uh, we started selling VR products all the way back then. Uh, a lot of the people doing VR now would be rather shocked, I think, at how interesting it was back then. Um, Later in the 1990s, I was the chief scientist of something called Internet2, which was an international academic consortium trying to figure out how to scale the internet so that it could become a global service. Um, I've done startups. I have, I've done four of them that went to Google, the pharmaceutical Pfizer, Oracle, and Adobe, so I've done that. I've done a whole lot of things, but there's this other thing I've done, which is starting very early, I became concerned that we were making big mistakes in how we were bringing digital technology to the world. And I started writing essays that people thought were insane. In the early 90s, I wrote an essay about how bots could sway elections. And people thought, this is crazy. <laughs> and I so, I have to tell you, um, making negative predictions about the future um, and then being right really sucks. I would very prefer, I would very strongly, strongly, dearly prefer for all of my negative predictions to have been wrong. But as it happens, they were right and it really is frustrating. So what I want to do now is try to describe to you a little bit about what I think our mistakes were. And I also want to describe to you in some detail what I believe is the most promising way to fix our mistakes. Um, and so I, uh, uh, this will become concrete. I'm not just gonna tell you ideas, I'm gonna tell you about specific things. You might find that boring, but you shouldn't. <laughs> this is what makes the world work. Okay, so what has gone wrong? Well, there's this interesting thing that's happened in the world where lately it seems like everything's gone crazy. Our most pressing immediate concern has to be the climate. And yet, politics around the world, instead of focusing on climate, has focused on this bizarre wing of, uh, wave of right-wing populism all over the place. Why do we have Modi and Trump and Erdogan and Duterte and on and on and on? Why are all these people happening at the same time? Well, there are many explanations. You can talk about demographics, the wealth gap. You can talk about um, immigration, stirring paranoia. You can talk about all these things, but all these countries are different. We've seen this phenomenon in Sweden and in Brazil. What do Brazil and Sweden have in common? Not much. <laughs> and so, very nice people, but other than that, very little in common. So, um, what, does, what does everybody have in common? It's that this shift happens after Facebook arrives. And uh, that's the only thing in common I can see. And so we have to say, you know, something about the way we're doing digital information is making us crazy and is preventing us from focusing on our problems. And so it becomes urgent that we fix that because that won't just apply to climate change. It'll apply to any other problem we might be lucky enough to face in the future. Right? It creates a dead end immediately. So uh, why, why specifically are we being made crazy? Well, I have a theory about that. Uh, you might not like it, 
because unfortunately some of the founding ideas of at least the first singularity university in California are kind of aligned with the theories that I, with the ideas that I think made us go wrong. So if you don't like what I have to say, sorry. Uh, you'll just feel challenged and enjoy it. Now, as it happens, I was around at the very moment, in the very room where some of these ideas were born, just because of my strange history. There are two principal ideas and two principal problems. I'm going to describe them both to you, and then I'm going to describe the solutions. Uh, the first one I'm going to start with was born in the early 1980s, and it was a certain kind of idea of what openness and democracy and freedom should look like in the digital world. And this is where the idea of open stuff comes from, open culture, creative commons, this is where um, open source, this whole, this whole culture, uh, music should be free, everything should be free on the internet. Um, it was born in a horrible little room that was falling apart, the walls were cracking, there was garbage everywhere, it was just <laughs> crazy because we were just crazy young hippies. And my friend Richard Stallman had this idea. He, some of you might have heard of him, he's the founder of the um, open or free software movement. Um, and he was crying because some software he'd written for a computer had been bought from the university, from MIT, and was now out of his control and was proprietary. And he just was so offended and it was just like losing a child. And he started this movement. And I can understand his emotions. I actually had tremendous sympathy for him at the time. And so this was this idea that on the internet, everything would be shared. We wouldn't have private property exactly. Instead, we'd give everything away. Everything would be this open commons. You're all familiar with it. Um, to this day, if you say something is open source, it has a little extra sparkle. Um, now, at the time, uh, that was not problematic. And most decent people kind of got on that idea. There was this other thing going on, though, which in tech culture, there was this um, culture of worshiping the tech entrepreneur. And a good example of this was Steve Jobs at that time. So there's this idea that the tech entrepreneur is like this super person. Like, if you're a good tech entrepreneur, the way Jobs put it, you can dent the universe. You have this Nietzschean superpower, more than the ordinary person, to determine the course of the future. Now, there's a little problem here, which I hope you can see. On the one hand, you have tech culture embracing this idea that everything has to be free. Online, we're, 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 we're sharing. It's kind of like a neo-Marxian idea, if you like. Everything is shared, everything's communal. But we worship entrepreneurialism, we worship capitalism basically. We, 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 we are, we're going to go out and succeed and get rich and that's a good thing. All right, now here's this problem. These two things are different. One is kind of like communism, one's kind of like capitalism, both very extreme cases. How do you combine those? There's exactly one way to do it. Exactly one little tiny point of intersection. Nobody's ever described another one. And this is what was discovered around the turn of the century, around 20 years ago, uh, which is the advertising business model. So the idea is you share everything, everything's for free. How does it get paid for? Because somebody's paying for advertisements. Now, at first, this was cute. At first, it was actually kind of cool when Google was just starting. I, I knew them when they were just like in a little tiny room, like not that much bigger than this stage. And it was cute. It was like a cute idea. But the problem is, remember this whole business about accelerating change? The computers got faster and faster. Memory got bigger and bigger. Uh, bandwidth got bigger and bigger. The algorithms got better and better. All the players, all the humans in the loop got more and more experienced and sophisticated. And before long, it transformed into this other thing. It became this constant surveillance of people and this constant manipulation of people. And I mean, it's just a bizarre idea. If you step back for a second, we're all used to it. We do it every day. 
Every single thing we do on our phones is likely to be funded this way. But think about how, imagine somebody told you about the civilization where any time two people connect or interact, the only way it's financed is by a third person who wants to manipulate those two. Is that not strange? Every single thing you do is financed by somebody in the middle who hopes to trick you. That is the society we've built, which is just so weird. Um, now, there's an argument, who cares? What if, what if what I do is being funded by somebody who wants, to go to, wants me to get coffee at one cafe instead of the other cafe? What difference does it make? It's very minor. And in many cases, that's true. But the problem is that the entire architecture is optimized for this kind of thing. And what that means is that sophisticated players, many of whom are creeps, many of whom are psychological warfare operatives working for some creepy totalitarian government, of which there are a number now, um, they get sophisticated at leeching off of the system. They do it by creating fake accounts to feed fake data into these algorithms to create a fake reality for you. And nobody has figured out how to stop that because the entire architecture is optimized for precisely that thing. So this becomes an increasingly insane problem. You start to have the big companies like Google and Facebook hiring whole armies, cities of people who are trying to go over content to moderate what's being added by a mountain of bots that's even larger, an even bigger mountain. The chances of a new account being authentically a person on either Facebook or Google are down to 1%. 99% are fakes designed to manipulate algorithms by feeding fake data to them and, and then also feeding fake data directly to other people, to, to real people. And then even the moderators that are hired start to go crazy from having to see all this manipulative content. And so you have this intractable problem. And then meanwhile, we're put in a position of asking these companies to censor us. We're saying, oh, please, Facebook, you have to prevent this kind of speech and that kind of speech and that kind of speech. And these things are genuinely horrible. These are gen genuinely hateful and murderous and intolerable so-called speech events. And yet, what kind of path are we heading down where we're demanding that some big corporation tell us what we can say again and again and again? Where does that lead us? So that's one problem. That's one reason that the current internet is making us crazy. But then there's another problem. Um, and this goes back to another moment that I happen to be present for. If you talk, there might be, are there people here from Google or Facebook? Anybody? You can admit it, it's okay. I love, I love, I love those companies. I saw somebody put up their hand like this and then down. Okay. No, I mean, I, I still have friends there. We're, we're good, we're good. It was an innocent mistake, I think. Um, but anyway, um, if you talk to people from these companies, they'll say, oh no, this whole thing about advertising, this is just temporary. Our real businesses were AI companies. We're gathering all this data to make AIs and, and the giant tech companies are in this AI race. Google and Microsoft and uh, all the others, that we're, we're, we're racing to have this super AI and then the super AI will solve climate change or whatever. So this is the only problem. Getting there first with super intelligence is the only thing that matters. We're going to do it by stealing all your data because that's what drives it. Data is the fuel for AI. And we're, we're going to make this into common sense AI. Okay. So there's a, there's a, there are a few problems with that. But in order to talk about that, I want to go back to the source point where this idea came from. And uh, my, my, the, the person who was the most significant mentor to me when I was just a kid and incredibly generous and sweet to me was named Marvin Minsky. Have any of you heard of Marvin? Okay, so Marvin... Um, Let's say, if the general way of thinking about virtual reality and the mythology and the culture and the sense of what it looks like, if that, that kind of came mostly from me, probably, our way of thinking about artificial intelligence mostly came from Marvin Minsky. Marvin passed away a few years ago. He was a professor at MIT, um, and he is probably the principal author of how we think about AI. Uh, he was incredibly brilliant, 
uh, did a lot of the foundational work in computer science about what kinds of problems can be solved with algorithms and things like that. So uh, when I was uh, a teenager and I met him, we immediately started to argue because I hated the idea of AI. <laughs> I just thought it was a terrible idea. And uh, this, uh, he loved arguing with me. We, we both had great pleasure in it. And one of the things that's interesting to me is a lot of times the founders of something are much more open-minded than the second or third generations. And now if I say, you know, AI is just like not a good way to think about computers, people say, how can you say that? AI is doing this and that, and it's this major thing. But with Marvin, who made it up, it was like, great. Um, the last time I saw him was just before he died, and one of our mutual friends called me and he said, oh, Marvin is very frail, he's very frail. Don't argue with him, he can't take it. Be careful. So I went to his house and he looked up at me and smiled. He said, are you ready to argue? <laughs> and we were able to have our argument for the last time. So I wanna share the argument with you in, in a very brief form, because of course this can go on for days and years. And in fact, it did go on for decades between us. So um, the starting point is just to acknowledge something, which is that um, there's no absolute certainty in deciding whether something is a person or person-like or not. We have some latitude in how we think about things. Some people think of certain animals as being more person-like than other animals. Uh, most of us think of our pets as being kind of person-like. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. Like, you can go to parts of the world where people eat dogs or horses or whatever, and sometimes, sometimes that'll cause offense because it violates someone else's sense of the status of those animals. And it's very, very hard to come to a precise idea of what you should treat as being person-like. Now, Marvin's idea was that we should, and that, I mean, of course, this goes back to Alan Turing and the Turing test, and which is a fascinating thing, but I'm gonna skip over that in the interest of time. Uh, Marvin's proposal was that we treat the computer as if it's um, an organism like us, a person like us that's becoming more and more like us and will surpass us eventually. The term singularity had not yet been coined. That would come a little later with somebody named Werner Vinge, but uh, we already had the concept of, of the singularity. Uh, uh, von Neumann had actually had that idea. Uh, and uh, so what I was saying is that, you know, and, and, and see, the, 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 the ideological context was that throughout history, people with narrow minds have been trying to elevate humans and put humans at the, sense, the center, and they've always been wrong. Galileo said, it doesn't really make sense to think of the universe revolving around the earth, and he was right, but he went to jail. Uh, Darwin said, you know, we must have evolved from animals, and he was like, no, 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 people are divine. That argument is still going on, and uh, Darwin was right. So um, isn't it just some sort of sentimental human fallacy to say, oh no, people are special. No, 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 these, these computers will be even more special. Um, so my argument was purely pragmatic. I was saying, I think it's useless to argue metaphysics. You can't argue about whether a computer has consciousness inside or something, you'll never know. Um, we only grant each other a sense of consciousness through faith. I mean, we can't really be inside each other's heads. Even if we could through some kind of neural link, we wouldn't really, really know if there was some other center of experience. There's, there's no way to have anything but faith ultimately when it comes to the consciousness of others or the, the sense of experience of others. But there are pragmatic questions about what <laughs> interest is served, what result you get according to your belief. If you believe the sun is the center of the world, it becomes intractable to calculate space travel. I mean, it's, there's just a definite reason why that's a terrible idea. Um, if you believe that humans are separate from evolution, it becomes impossible to understand disease or agriculture or planning. Everything becomes impossible. So that's also a terrible idea. But it might make sense to believe in people as being special versus computers. I think in that case, the calculus comes out differently. Now let me give you an example that's more recent that explains why I believe this. There are a few services, and the lab where I do most of my work, the research organization at Microsoft is one of them, one of the principal ones in the world now, that do automatic translation between languages, between English and French, let us say. 
Uh, so Marvin had actually assigned some students back in the late 50s to try to make this language translator. He gave it to some grad students as a summer project. Just take two dictionaries and a Chomsky-like uh, description of grammar, and then you should be able to get a translation. But that didn't work. And people tried and tried and tried for decades. In the 90s, some researchers at IBM tried a completely different way. Instead of trying to represent language, they just did, well, they didn't just do it. They did a combination, but they did statistics, big data. They took a vast corpus, a vast database, and did statistical correlations of phrases and by mashing up a bunch of phrases that happened to have been translated by a human, you could get a resulting document that was readable for the first time. And while we've improved upon it over the years, that's still essentially what we're doing. And I love it. I think it's a fantastic service. I think it's amazing to get spontaneous translations, even if they're not perfect, because when would they ever be perfect anyway, even if people did them? It's a fantastic service. The world is better because of it. But there's this really strange thing. There's a profession of people who are translators, right? And they've seen their career options destroyed. And they have followed the pattern that we saw earlier with other people whose value could be transmitted over the internet. Recording musicians, investigative journalists, um, photographers. All these people, as, now this might be a bit different in Europe where there's some non-market non ways to support people. In the US, they're, it's almost exclusively market-based and their lives have just been destroyed. Now, to get into some technical detail, what actually happens to somebody who's in this category isn't so much, um, they, they, they see about a tenth of the number of career options that they used to, and there's still a few, a tiny minority that do well. And the reason I'm making this sign with my hand is that there's just a tiny, tiny number of people at the top of what we call a zip distribution, and then it falls off to a very, very thin long tail. Whereas before the internet, there was a bell curve with a a big concentration in the middle. So you see it, this transformation from the bell curve to the zip curve when everybody is regimented from a central point. And there, there's mathematical reasons for that. But anyway, that's what happens. Now, so we're telling all these translators, you're obsolete. You no longer have work because we have a big electronic brain that is doing the job you used to do. But it's a lie. And the reason it's a lie is that language is alive. You can't just make one AI once and then have it translate forever. Instead, just like a person, it needs constant input of new phrase translations because every day there's news, every day there are jokes and memes and videos and movies and TV and all this stuff. You have to keep up or you cannot communicate. And so, what we do, and just to be very blunt about it, is we steal tens of millions of example phrase translations every single night when we go through, and we've just found these people all over the world. We do it, Google does it, and there's a few other places that do it. All over the world, we have identified people who just happen to do phrase translations. Some of them are on social media who have family members who are bilingual. Some of them are volunteer captioners. There's just all kinds of situations. But anyway, we've identified these people. We steal their phrase translations. They don't know. They don't know. They have no idea that they're contributing value. And then every day we say, here's our magic giant electronic brain. Now the thing is, AI works like this universally. It's sometimes called the last mile problem of, L uh, of AI. AI can be very good, but then to actually get it to quite work, you always need like fresh updates, you need edge cases, and so you end up hiring loads of people, often in poor parts of the world, to hide behind the curtain to fake it, to make the AI seem autonomous, or you just steal from people if you can, which in the case of translation, we can. So there's something very strange here. And this was the argument I had with Marvin. Um, aren't we committing a sort of a crime, both an economic crime and an ethical crime, but also a spiritual crime in telling people that they're not needed when they actually are needed? Isn't there something very horrible about that? And so then he would say, but wait a second. The AIs will get better and better, so eventually they'll be teaching themselves. So they will be self-sufficient, 
and you really won't be able to say that anymore. And then I would counter, so here's my counter argument to that idea, which is, okay, let's imagine a future which we'll probably never get to perfectly, but we'll approach it asymptotically. Let's imagine a future where robots do all the necessary labor, robots do all the, ne all the intellectual labor that's necessary so people live lives of leisure. It's a future that Karl Marx anticipated, even Plato talks about it. We get to this point where machines do all the work. What is the status of the people? <laughs> what is the status of the people? So my argument is that the more advanced an economy becomes, that's based on advances in technology, typically, once, since the world's already fully colonized, there's nothing else to grab. You know, at this point, it's only knowledge that increases, um, or mostly. And what, what, what is the difference between an advanced economy and a developing economy? Uh, one of the differences is, is that there are more and more sectors in an advanced economy that are about wants instead of needs that are about what we can call luxury, as per one of the slides in, in a <laughs> presentation earlier. Um, this is, uh, you probably know the idea of uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Is that familiar? So, so you're climbing, as, civilization, as technology gets better, you're climbing up this pyramid where you are interested in more and more subjective or taste-based things. And so the huge industries that we have that are really just based on our tastes are uh, design, sports, entertainment, travel, um, fashion, cosmetics. These are like giant industries and they're just based on what we want. If you get to a super advanced society, you should get to a point where everything is based on needs and the needs either come from the people or from an algorithm. And so if you say, well, it's AI deciding what you should want, then you're putting people in a subservient position. Is that really what you want? No, no, no. The utopia you want is one where people are getting what they want and they have some kind of authenticity. It's not, they're not just being programmed by some behavioral manipulation. And in that case, all of the value comes from their taste. It's the taste of people that's the real value of the AI. So there's no case where the AI is really independent and also valuable. Do you follow that argument? It's a, it, so it's correct. <laughs> That's the correct answer. So the thing is, if you really believe that in this, this fully automated future, AIs can decide what people want, then what you're doing is you're giving up on you deciding what you want. And now, th this idea of what are computers for, you know, the very first implementation of a network experience where somebody got online and interacted was designed by, get ready for it, B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist. And this was before the internet. This was before packet switching. This was before ARPANET. And Skinner was hoping to create this network experience in which everybody would be programmed. Everyone would be in a Skinner box, essentially, being monitored and then getting behavioral feedback in order to make their behavior patterns uh, controlled, predictable, to create a perfect society without, without messy individuals, without variation, uh, without... And if you want to measure how much variation there is, look for those bell curves, because that's the mathematical indicator. So it would be a society of those zip curves. And of course, we're implementing Skinner's vision. We're imp implementing it through these monster central hubs like uh, Google and Facebook on the so-called advertising model. Now, um, there's, oh my God, my time's gonna run out. Um, the specific way that this model makes people crazy is something that needs, it needs a bit of description and after I've dug into it, I'll go into some of the solution space. So the way the model works is it's a feedback loop. The very first uh, mission of any algorithm in one of these hubs is to uh, engage you and then the secondary mission is to persuade you. Those are the terms of art that we use in Silicon Valley. I prefer addict and manipulate to engage and persuade, doesn't matter though. Now, how do you operate the feedback loop? The way you do it is you provide some stimulus to people and then you try to see what their response is and then you factor that into what the next stimulus is. That's, that's the feedback loop. Now, the problem with that is that the AI algorithms, 
The first thing is that they're not very good. Um, they're pretty crude. Uh, but the other thing is that the channel we have to observe people is also not very good. So if you click on something and you stay longer, you're considered engaged, naturally enough. So then we have to ask, what kind of responses in humans get you to click on something and stay longer? And the answer is there are all kinds of responses that could, but overall, statistically, the most common emotional reaction that gets you to click on something and stay longer is what we call the fight or flight responses. And so these are very deep, old emotional responses uh, that all of us have where we get scared or aggressive as a matter of survival. They're very, very deep. And so if somebody gets um, s scared uh, or angry, they'll click more. Now sometimes people click out of love or affection or admiration or all kinds of things, but statistically that happens more often. Actually, it doesn't happen more often, it's just detectable more often, which is a, a crucial distinction. If responses are measured in laboratory conditions outside of the smartphone, then you see a kind of a parity between different kind of emotional reactions. But if you ask what can you measure with the devices people use, then you end up favoring the fight or flight. Follow that? Okay, so now what is the consequence of that? Um, there are two consequences that are really crucial. One consequence is that people are getting these emotions triggered more often than in previous circumstances. And so everybody becomes a little more paranoid and a little more irritable. The effect is not great. A good approximate sense that we've gotten from what studies are possible is like maybe a percent more a year. But the problem is, that for some people it's much more than that and also it appears to be cumulative. Uh, so <laughs> this is part of I think why we see the rise of politics that is so based on paranoia and irritability. Everybody's like oh yeah those people those people over there and like and uh, or they might be afraid uh, and so the politicians who are able to key into that have suddenly this um, amplification that they didn't have before. Now the internet did not invent these responses. They've always been there and there have always been politicians who are good at using these. It's just tipping the scales a little bit to favor these people. But then there's another thing that happens which might even be worse. And I'm going to use an example of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. Have you all heard of that? Do you know what that, okay. So when Black Lives Matter started they got what I call a magic carpet ride on the internet because you use tools like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube to post content about your cause and then it just seems to amplify and it's like suddenly you have this giant cause that seems to make much more progress much more quickly than it would have in previous eras. So you think, wow, this internet thing's fantastic, yay. Okay, then what happens is the algorithms take whatever content you uploaded, all your tweets and your images and everything, your movies, and they start moving them around randomly to see how they can engage people. Okay, so who are the people who provide the most measured, measurable engagement? Well, it's the people who are made angry or fearful. So suddenly, the algorithm detects the nascent racists, the Ku Klux Klan, the neo-Nazis, and it introduces them to each other, and then it reinforces them more. And nobody even realizes it's happening because it's just stupid algorithms. There's nobody, well, there maybe are a very tiny number of people who are sympathetic with this, but in general, there are very, very, very few people who are sympathetic with this sort of thing within the tech world. A tiny, tiny minority have made themselves crazy by using their own technology. But most, most of us are horrified by it, and yet it happens systemically. So initially there's the magic carpet ride, and then this horrible thing happens a little later. And it happens over and over again. Um, the uh, Arab Spring had this magic carpet ride on, on internet companies, and then exactly the same stuff connected and was used more effectively even by ISIS later on. So you see this pattern repeated and repeated. Um, Okay, how to fix it. Uh, I have six minutes to tell you how to fix it. All right. Uh, the first thing is I have a proposal that sounds wrong and bad and just terrible to some people on first hearing, and I just want you to give it a chance, which is to not make the internet free anymore. So what I propose is that you be paid for your data 
and that you pay for stuff instead of expecting it for free. Uh, let me talk about both sides of this. Being paid for your data. Uh, some of the big companies, particularly Facebook, are afraid of this being a coming wave, so they're constantly putting out this, uh, this uh, notion, this meme, if you like, that, um, oh, you'd only get paid pennies. Your data's worthless, worthless, worthless. Well, that's not true. Um, if uh, every model that we've built of it, and we've tried analytic models and agent-based simulations, it shows that your data is actually worth a lot worth more than a basic income would be. In fact, this is a better idea than a basic income model for when the robots come. The basic income idea to me is this dead end, because, well, a couple of problems with it. One is human dignity, but because like, you're just like getting money for being there, and at some point, you're, there's some lack of acknowledgement of you and your efforts, but there's a deeper problem, which is that has, and this problem has appeared with every single communist-like experiment. If you have some central authority that's sending out the benefits, it has concentrated power. And even if it starts out wonderfully, it'll be corrupted by people who take it over. You might start with Bolsheviks, and whatever you think of them, the Stalinists are worse, and the Stalinists will show up if you start this thing. So that's a good reason not to do basic income. But anyway, this thing will provide more distributed um, income. And the other thing is... Um, your life cycle in this world is one in which you start getting little royalty streams, not one-time sales, but royalty streams from licensing your data in a multitude of ways, and the number of ways increases as new technological ideas appear. And then, so your, your royalty income starts growing, and then it becomes your retirement, uh, presuming we don't all live forever in, in some future world. So it, it creates a lifetime dignified, finance solution that's widely distributed and very dignified. You can specialize in certain kinds of data, uh, and although all of your different kinds of data might be useful. We have evidence that this could be vastly important for the developing world, and um, one of our properties at Microsoft is called Skype, and we've detected tens of millions at least, at probably over 50 million, maybe even 100, of people in the developing world who are delivering value over live video as a way to make a living. A lot of this is stuff like music lessons, tutoring, religious lessons, language lessons, advice, um, yoga, all, counseling, all kinds of stuff. This is, there's an incredible amount of widely distributed value out there, but if, if our very ideology makes us insist that people aren't valuable and it's only our big electronic brain, as with the example I gave you before, we're not acknowledging all of that brilliance and value that's out there in the world. What about paying for stuff? Will you be willing to? Well, yeah, people are willing to pay for Netflix, even though it's easy to pirate videos. You do it because... It's just easier, and you're getting a certain kind of certainty and a lack of hassle. And you do, you know, so I think we know people will pay. We know that if people are paid, they'll do well. So economically, the thing can work. And the main impediment is the stubbornness of just a few corporations. I have two and a half minutes to tell you the most important idea, and I'll try to do it really fast. Every working economy has some way that people can come together in groups to avoid an each against each competition. In capitalism, we're able to form corporations if we're on the capital side of the equation or limited partnerships if you're a lawyer. Um, on the labor side, if you believe in that division, you can form a union, which has got some things in common with a corporation. It gets people to work together. There needs to be something like a union in the future so that the, the value of data isn't driven down to zero by person-to-person -person competition. We can see that happening already on something like Mechanical Turk. We've done experiments with Mechanical Turk where we've created people who are able to unionize and collectively bargain. They make more money, but the data quality and their work quality goes up so much that ultimately the buyer also does better, particularly for feeding machine learning algorithms. So it's a win-win situation. You might not believe me, but give it a, it's true. Do your own experiments, you'll find that this is so. This idea of a union of people who provide data in order to prevent prices from going to zero is something we call a MID, for a mediator of individual data. MIDs serve a couple of other functions. Um, in one way, they're a little like the Grameen bank idea in microlending. All the members of a MID look out for each other 
so that they have to build a collective brand and a collective reputation. And that way, the problem of hate speech and fake speech and poor quality work and garbage and shitposting, all of these things become duties that are distributed instead of petitioning a single central authority like Facebook to manage. Similarly, um, free speech is maintained without giving the most speech to the most annoying person, which is what happens right now. And the reason why is that when people band together into groups, if that group is terrible, then the group as a whole starts to lose authority, lose trust, and lose audience. There was always a Nazi magazine in the US, but nobody noticed it until the internet, because in this context, whoever is whoever is the most annoying gets the most attention because it's all fight or flight. The, the, the algorithms are directing people according to fight or flight responses for the most part. In this case, there would instead be a world of uh, brands competing, which is actually a way to get free speech without making the worst people the most vocal. Uh, there's some other things we need to accomplish. I don't, it, it, it's a... I'm tech, ooh, I'm almost out of time. I'm out of time. Ah, I was afraid this would be hard. Okay, so in summary, the solution space for this particular craziness is to create a social, political, and economic structure where people can work as groups. Uh, some of them might be in the millions, some of them might be small, some of them might be specialized, some of them might be based on involuntary data like how you walk or something. But this is a way to distribute responsibility for the internet away from the core to raise value. Um, the uh, future economy should be one in which these entities compete for each other. Um, for various reasons, that should create a bell curve result instead of a zip curve result. And then what it does most of all is it defunds the engine that makes money precisely off of making people crazy. Okay, the problem, the solution. That's the talk. <laughs> okay. Please stay, stay, stay. Um, first of all, Jan, wow. You know, you took me on a trip from small rooms to, to the beginning of the internet to now the solution. And that, for my age, I don't know if I can handle it. Uh, but it will be my diary. Those are more expert, advanced people here. I was wondering, does anybody has a question oh, before we right. go to we're that? Gonna do, we're going to do questions. Okay, no, good. If, if, I, I, was, I don't know the level of the people in this room. I know that some are from Belgium, so probably there is a good... Oh, here it is. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, well... Blockchain is... It, Every, yeah, blockchain. You all know what blockchain is, right? Yeah. Okay. So blockchain is potentially a useful tool. I think the idea of a distributed trust mechanism is a good idea. Uh, the, blockchain specifically bothers me because the very thing that makes it work is a giant carbon footprint. And I just don't think we can... Like if the whole world was running on blockchain, we'd have a real problem. Um, so, it, I think we need something much more efficient. But then there's another thing about blockchain. Blockchain creates um, trust to its edge, and then there's a cliff. All right. So what you see again and again with blockchain-based systems is that the blockchain mechanism itself is pretty reliable. But then you have fraudulent exchanges and people just forgetting their, you know, their 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 uh, value disappears just because they made a mistake and for, forgot something. Or you have fraud of different kinds. And so I think this idea that you can have absolute perfect algorithmic trust is false because what happens is whenever you do that, you can do it mathematically, but then at the edge there's a cliff and then you have all these criminals and hounds and goblins at the edge of the cliff waiting for you to fall off the cliff. So I think you need to have a system that goes down more gradually so that you have an, you, the edge of trust has to be smooth and then you can see the goblins on the way up. And so if you combine those two observations, that blockchain needs to be more efficient, and that also perfect efficiency might actually be a fake, it suggests that the protocol we really want is statistically 
close to perfect, but not perfect, and much more efficient, and has a much smoother edge instead of a cliff. And so I think we can build that. In fact, I mean, I've seen a few things that do it, and we've played around with a few in the lab. Uh, but that, that's, but the, general, the general direction of blockchain is reasonable. The other thing to say is um, the blockchain community has gotten much better since there have been crashes and volatility, because a lot of the get-rich-quick people are out the door. So now I think we have a really valuable community of people who actually are trying to make things better. So if what you mean by blockchain is the community of people interested in it, then they're essential. Okay, make it goblin-proof. Another question? I now have a, a box that I can throw at people. Yeah, sir. <laughs> I have to throw it, otherwise it doesn't work. There you go. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, congratulations, by the way. Very well done. So I'm going to stand. I'm Yunis. I work in Luxembourg. I'm one of the few from Luxembourg. Okay, don't brag. Oh, I could tell immediately. I mean... Yeah, he catches yeah. like a Luxembourg. With a beard. It's a typical Luxembourgish beard, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what do you think about the future of uh, VR, uh, of XR in general? Can you say just a few... Because uh, you're the founder... Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh my. Well, you know, a lot of the origin of VR was in that same argument with Marvin Minsky because he would say, you know, well, okay, so you believe people are magical and people have souls or something. What does that get you? And so uh, to me, from like if you were talking to me when I was 20 or something, what I would say is back, which was a long time ago. Um, what I would say is that VR is kind of the opposite of AI because uh, VR only makes sense if you believe in internal experience, if you believe in some kind of center of consciousness. And, and here's the reason why. You're in the simulated world. Uh, everything can change. One of the things I did the most experiments with in the early days was changing your body to different non-human bodies. I was always very fascinated by that, becoming different kinds of lobsters and octopuses and all this kind of stuff. And so you can change your body, you can change the world, you can change the rules by which reality works, you can change how you perceive, how, how time feels, you can do all this stuff. And yet, with all those changes, there's this little still spot that continues through it all. That's you. So in a way, Virtual reality is a consciousness noticing machine, and it's the only one that's quite like it, except may maybe some kind of meditation practice or something. But just in order to, for VR to even exist, you have to be like this floating consciousness. Otherwise, it doesn't even make sense to talk about it. And that's a kind of a remarkable thing about it. Most digital devices are designed to make you feel like you don't exist. Like you talk to the voice assistant and it's like, oh, we're equals, we're talking, you know. And you're, you're turned into data. It's almost like there's a simulation of you in your device and in the cloud. But VR is exactly the opposite. And so um, what I always thought VR would lead to was some sort of a future in which people think of themselves as being more magical than they used to and a future in which... Um, Oh God, my old, <laughs> the idea was that instead of people, instead of the future being um, a quest for more and more power, which would probably lead to our destruction, it would be to more and more creativity for sharing with each other and connecting to each other, which could be an infinite quest that has no end, um, that could really go on for billions of years, as was proposed in a talk, uh, whereas technology for technology's sake probably can't be advanced for billions of years. Sooner or later we'll destroy ourselves on that. But this kind of creative communication and connection thing. So I just thought of it as like a form of shared intentional waking state dreams. I had a whole big rap about it. Um, I still do that talk once in a while and it's still fun. But um, so that's what I see the future of virtuality is some kind of a celebration of, hum of the magical quality of humans and, and this kind of intense creative... Um, in the future, I think there'll be good enough tools that you can improvise virtual reality. You can improvise the content of it as fast as you now speak. So you'd actually be making worlds and um, that this notion of dreams that you just play like music. Like you have a musical instrument, but instead of music, the whole world comes out and is changing. And this idea used to be very abstract, but just recently... There's some younger people in my lab who can do it, who can improvise virtual reality so fast that you can start to feel this new kind of communication emerging. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit. Um, but I mean, I spent most of my time not on that stuff. I, I spent most of my time on things like surgical simulation and, and practical things. Um, more recently, I'm, there's a device called a HoloLens that does com um, a mixed reality device uh, that we finally got working after many years. and. Um, so that, uh, that's another kind of thing I'm interested in, but that's a whole other talk, yeah. Yeah, you're satisfied with that yeah. answer? Yeah. There's a person behind you. You can throw the box to that person. We have two more minutes. 
Be brief. Yeah, um, you, you didn't tell us any doomsday, uh, basically, uh, vision for the future, a little bit. I didn't tell you any doomsday vision? No. Well, the thing is, The whole you know, talk was about doomsday. No, really, no, really. <laughs> Look, I mean, like, doomsday is the, is the cliche of our times. Every, every day is doomsday now. You know, I mean, the amazing thing, if you look at the news now, the first 10 stories are horrible. It's like, um, the president of this big country just said something so stupid you can't believe it. And then the other one did this other thing that's so stupid you can't believe it. And then all of these are ignoring climate change. All of them are violating human rights. Over in America, we're separating babies from their parents, as like we used to with slaves, all over again, even though we thought we'd given that up. And it's just so depressing. And then the feel-good story at the end is, hey, over at Google, they have a robot that'll be able to do your job. Look how cute it is. And then you're thinking, oh my God, there's no future. Um, I, I've been... Uh, <laughs> I've been talking to, I like talking to teenagers, and one of the things I've been hearing from them is just this incredible pessimism that's unlike anything I ever heard before. I grew up in the Cold War when we were afraid of nuclear war, but we all thought if we avoided nuclear war, then we'll be okay. But they don't feel like, they feel like, well, if we make it through climate change, then we'll be replaced by robots. It's almost like they're in this checkmate situation, and I hear things like, why did our parents have us? Why are we here? And that's a kind of darkness that is just terrible. And so in order for us to make it, we have to both find a way to make it through this crazy making thing and then use that little bit of sanity to deal with our climate. And, uh, and uh, we have a few other things aside from the climate to deal with. Um, and then at the end of the day though, we have to get human centered. You know, we can't, you can't be a technology centered species. You have to be a species centered species in order to survive. You know, and right now, this misdirection where we think it's about the technology, like we think it's about the giant electronic brain instead of the translators, serves the interest of whoever owns the electronic brain. So these days on the planet, your wealth is determined by how close you are to a giant computer, you know? And I've done really well with it. I'm close to a giant computer, so I'm doing, I'm doing well with that. Um, and that's true for the hedge fund people and the mobile phone operators and the tech companies and the central intelligence agencies around the world. Anybody who's close to a big computer is the wealthiest party. And obviously it can't go on that way because that's, it's just a form of uh, rent taking as uh, economists would put it. It's just like positional advantage. It's not actually, there's no ongoing obligation of being in that position to do anything decent. There has to be an economic and social structure that reorients us back to doing decently by each other. So. Um, uh, this, the I've given you just the barest outlines of a solution here. I want to say, if you're skeptical of the solution I just gave you, look around and if you can see anybody else who's articulating one. Seriously, because what I, what I always find is I go to conferences and people say, but, 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 and I say, great, be skeptical, be tough on me. Argue, 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 I love it. But also, what other alternative can you show me? Who, you know, like, there's this remarkable, in this whole world of futurism and technology, there's, re, there's this remarkable lack of actually trying to spell out what specifically you'd have to do. So that's what I'm attempting to do here. If anyone has a better plan, I really want to hear it. Uh, we don't have time for your plan right now. But, <laughs> but, no, no, thank you for it. Thank you so much. Give him a big applause, ladies and gentlemen.